Hey guys, this is CF The Natural, and I'd like to welcome you to part two of my hand history review from a couple three sessions that I played on Ignition Casino. As you know, Ignition Casino is the company that's taken over for uh, Bavada, and I've been playing there quite regularly, uh, especially given that uh, the traffic hasn't been particularly good on a juicy stakes where I used to play. So we've got 11 hands to get through today. Going to cover a number of different topics uh, and situations that we face in Omaha. So hopefully uh, it'll be entertaining and educational as uh, one of my teachers used to say, a math teacher, though I didn't really find math to be entertaining. Educational, I guess, but not entertaining. So uh, at any rate, let's get started here with our first hand, which is some 5 PLO, again on uh, Ignition Casino. Get a limp. I have a pretty decent double-suited hand here. Uh, obviously, the suitedness for the 6-9 isn't great, but the cards are somewhat connected. We do have a suited ace. Uh, great hand to see a flop with. Uh, I see people raise hands like this. Even on the button, and I'm in the cutoff here, I wouldn't raise this hand. There's just no reason to. Uh, there's still a lot of flops you'll miss. Just limp behind. If somebody else raises, I would probably call a raise, especially being a late position. But uh, as always, the goal is to see a flop as, as cheaply as possible. We do get a raise from the button. As you can see, of her 20 hands, he's 75-15. Clearly a very loose player. He's already lost you know, two-thirds of a buy-in. Um, only winning, what, one of five hands maybe? Yeah, so he's lost four or five at showdown. Pretty aggressive. Clearly a, a loose, possibly aggro player. Um, and he's very likely doing this with a big pair. You know, aces or kings, uh, queens. Um, maybe with a suit, maybe without. And so this hand does very well against that range. If he's just got aces, this is a good hand to crack aces. Connected, double-suited cards. So everybody else folds. Uh, I'm all too happy to call. Because as you know, my philosophy is, and say it after me, or say it with me, if I miss the board, I just let it go. I really don't have any problem. Uh, it's not as easy to do that in Hold'em. Too many heads-up pots and things, a different game. But in, in Omaha, it, really the name of the game is to be... Uh, if you're playing a good range, meaning you're not putting, you know, you're not limping and raising and calling with junk hands, but you're limited it to fairly quality hands like this, then the name of the game is you can call um, ISO raises, you can call three bets, and if you don't hit the board, you just dump it. And when you do hit the board, you're going to make all that money back that you lost when you dumped it, and then some, because a lot of people can't let their big hands go. And by big, I mean big pairs, two pairs not nutted hands. So we call with the intent of continuing or dumping if we don't hit. And we hit this flop really fucking hard. Uh, excuse my French. We have an open-ended straight draw, six, seven, eight, nine, and we have a nut flush draw. And two over cards. I wouldn't uh, really call those, you know, I don't even count those as outs, but for example, if he has a pair of kings, uh, in Hold'em, a pair of kings is a pretty good flop. I would take this flop any time with a pair of kings. Uh, but then, you know, an ace could be good to me. That could be three additional outs is all I'm saying. So it is possible. I wouldn't count on the queen, but the ace potentially could be good if he had, say, a pair of kings, pair of queens, uh, which I wouldn't put past somebody playing 75-15. But even without those, I have got 15 outs twice, and that's a shitload of equity. As you can see here, it's it's giving me 66%. Um, 15 outs twice. Um, that may be against his particular hand. If you just count the outs I have, uh, that's around 55% or so, more than more than 50% equity. So I'm in great shape and am more than willing to uh, to get the money in. So the question is, how do we play this hand? We don't even have a pair yet, but odds are we have more equity than our opponent, um, especially given that he raised on the button. You know what? kind of range like I said is he doing that with usually a rundown unless he's got something like 9 10 he can't have our flush draw out unless he has something like 9 10 jack queen or something we're, we're doing just extremely well against almost anything he has 
and or like six nine ten jack or something you know there's very few combos he can hold that are ahead of us or even even with us uh so the question is how do we want to proceed well uh that is very opponent dependent and looking at a guy like this as you can see pretty strong aggression by street overall uh and given what i put him on i like to go for the check raise i could lead here Against a tighter opponent, I might be afraid of checking and, and just having a card peel and not hitting anything. But in this case, I'm pretty confident a guy like this is going to bet. So I go ahead and check. And he obliges us. And not only does he bet, he bets full pot. Which I guess if you have a big pair, you want to try to protect it. Unfortunately, like I said, we got a ton of equity. So we go ahead and just check raise. And... Uh, if I was in this seat and I had a big pair, I'd be dumping this hand uh, so fast it'd make your head spin. Our opponent, though, isn't quite so smart. And he calls. Now, the turn doesn't help us, but it doesn't hurt us as much as it seems. Obviously, it puts a diamond flush draw out there. But we're only up against one opponent, not multiple opponents. The odds aren't very strong that he has diamonds. He'd have to go runner, runner. As you know, from the flop to the rear, that's only 4% that another di that diamond and then another diamond's going to come. Only 20% most that another one will come on the river. Uh, the 3, 4, the 4 doesn't complete anything but a 5, 6. If he had 5, 6, then yes, this gives him a straight. We still have a bunch of equity against that hand. You know, as our equity dropped, but we're still in very good shape. And we've only got less than $2 left in a $6 pot. So I think you know that the money's just going to go in here. Yes, we haven't hit anything yet. We're still drawing, but we're really, there's nothing else to do here. I just don't think this card improved him most of the time. So he obliges us. And let's see what he's got. And indeed, he had aces. Uh, the four gave him a gut shot. That's all it did. Didn't do anything else. Um, so we're behind here. We were ahead on the flop. We're behind now, but we still have really all of our original outs, right? We still have the six, seven, eight, nine. The five will still win for us. The 10 will still win for us. And any club will still win for us. So we still have our, our 15 outs. Even the diamond comes, it doesn't, doesn't hurt us. And fortunately, we do hit our, our flush on the river. We hit one of our 15 outs and we win a very big pot. Basically take his stack. Um, so anyways, the, the lesson here is that there's a lot of opponents that are stupid enough, and unfortunately I really can't think of a nicer word, dumb enough, I don't know, what, silly enough, whatever, to overplay something like this, a pair of aces. I don't have a problem with him raising on the button, that was fine, but when this flop came and I check raised him, he needed to get out of dodge. The aces are just are just never good. Now you might argue, well gee, if the river doesn't come, he wins. That's true. But I had more equity than him. He, he, you don't want to be stacking off with one pair on a wet connected board like this. And you guys know that. So don't make the mistake this guy did. Don't, don't play a monster pot with just a pair. Really silly. And worked out well for me, though. All right, let's take a look at our next hand. More five PLO. Get a limp. I have a uh, what's called a one gap rundown you notice six eight ten queen so it's exactly one gap all the way one gap between the six and eight one gap between the eight and ten one gap between the ten and queen and a suit this is again a really nice hand to see a flop with um and i very probably would call a raise with this hand if somebody in early position had raised i'd call a raise because you can hit straights you can hit flushes with this hand and as always if if i don't i just let it go in this case, I'm more than happy to limp behind. If one of these guys raises, I'm certain in position I will be calling. But nobody does, and we get to see a nice cheap flop. And I flop the nuts, because that's what I likes to do. And obviously, I have uh, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. I have, not only did I flop the nuts... I got a draw to a higher straight because I have seven, eight, nine, ten. So a six 
or a jack will give me a higher straight. I also have a queen high flush draw. You can see the equity I hold here. Much like the other hand, I flop, you know, I flop a, the best thing you can flop in PLO, in my opinion. And that is the nuts with redraws to better nuts. You always want to redraw in PLO if you can. Because there's so many ways that people can get lucky and beat you. Uh, and even here, we don't have the stone cold nuts at the end, right? We have the nuts now, but somebody can have two pair and they could hit a, a full house. So as you know, I like to play these hands generally pretty, pretty aggressively. Do not slow play hands like this. So we get a check. This guy bets 15 cents into a 20 cent pot. So what I mean by that is a lot of people would say, well, shit, look at this hand, Charles. You've got the nuts. You got to redraw to a higher nuts, both straight and flush. Just smooth call. Um, you could do that. I don't like to do that. One reason is it is a little too easy in PLO for somebody to get lucky with a two pair or a set. And the other reason is that in PLO, we have so many more draws than we do in Hold'em. So many more draws. And so it's just that much more likely that somebody will call you. For example, if this was Hold'em, and let's say I stood here with 6-8. And let's even say I had 6-8 of, of, of diamonds. So I had a redraw to a flush, plus I had the nut straight. You know, in that case, with this guy only holding two cards, what are the odds he has something like a set or two pair that, that is going to call down? Not very likely. And I can easily chase him off by raising. And he just doesn't have enough equity or outs to call me. But in PLO, it's very easy for people to have draws on this board, and they'll call you to the river. And so you want to take advantage of that. When the, By the time the Turner River gets there and they don't hit, then they're going to fold and you're going to lose your opportunity to get value. So I believe this is the place to get value, and I go ahead and raise. If he folds, he folds, but I think that the odds are decent that if he has any kind of a draw or a set or two pair, he's going to call me. Maybe even re-raise me. He, he has no idea I'm sitting there with the, with the nuts. And indeed, he does re-raise me. What does he do this with? Well, he could have a number of things. He could have a set, five, sevens, or nines. I'm, I'm well ahead of that. He could have a flush draw. He could have uh, a straight draw. Could have two pair. Truth be told, I don't really give a damn what he has. Because the money's is going in. And so I re-raise. He obliges me. Let's take a look. So... He has a straight and a flush draw. His flush draw is really weak. Six high. His straight draw is the lower end. I showed this hand because this is a good example of what you should not do. Now, only three hands. The guy was 33-33. Looked to potentially be a tag. Look at this, 0.2%. I have his flush draw dominated. I have his straight draw dominated. I don't even know where the 0.2 is. I don't see any way he can win this hand. Um, I really don't. I think I pretty much got him drawing dead. But the point being, don't get your money in like this. Uh, he's only in three hands, so I guess he didn't know I was the tightest player at the table, although this 29-2 is pretty close. Um, but when you have the bottom end of a straight draw on a board like this, and your flush draw is only six high, don't, don't put your money in, okay? If somebody's willing to get their money in against you, you're generally, at best, you're going to be, excuse me, flipping and very possibly you're crushed. And I have him crushed here. I was thrilled when I saw his hand because I thought he probably had a set or something like that. And he still has live cards. Here he's got nothing. And uh, you can see now he is drawing dead. I don't know where the point two came from. And that's that. And he hands me a whole buy, 100 big blinds, an entire buy-in. And he didn't have to do that. When he bet, I was fine with his bet, and I raised, he, he should have just let it go. Just should have let it go. Re-raise me? No, that's, wow. So, you don't want to do this, guys. Uh, you're going to play a draw aggressively. Have a nut draw. Don't have a, none of his, none of his outs were to the nuts. And that's the lesson here. You want the majority of your outs to be to the nuts. He didn't have any outs to the nuts, and it cost him 100 big blinds. 
All right. Next hand. Some more 5 PLO. So everybody folds, and it's me against this player. Now, 32 hands. I've been here 166. In the 32 hands I'd been here, I'd played uh, against this guy. I'd seen this guy quite a bit. In 77-0, he was quite loose. He also had a habit of betting very small, like one big blind, uh, with his draws. He chased a lot of draws. He had a habit of betting very small, trying to name his price for those draws, uh, and, and playing too many hands and too wide of a range. So knowing that information, let's see how I can try to take advantage of that. So he limps. Um, I mean, I guess I could raise here. I do have a pretty nice connected hand, five, six, eight, nine, one gapper uh, with a suit. But again, I just don't see a reason to do that. Um, building a pot with a hand like this, like I said, I'll have plenty of time to get money in if indeed I hit something. So I just check. Well, I don't, I don't hit this flop, really. I do hit a pair of nines. Um, the good thing about that is that he isn't that likely to have an ace or queen. He did limp, although he, he hasn't really raised a hand yet. Um, so he does his usual. He bets five cents. Now, I decide to call. Not so much because I have a pair of nines. Bottom pair, of course, here. But because he, I know that this just doesn't mean he has that much. He'd been doing this quite a bit, and, and I just felt like um, he was going to do this with his whole range. And for five cents, I want to see another card in case I could pick up, you know, uh, a nine could hit. That's obviously only two outs. But with the five, six, eight, if some kind of like if an eight hits, a 10, a seven, a six, a five, you know, it's going to give me more equity in a draw. And then he'll probably just bet his five cents and I may be able to see the river uh, very cheaply and, and get lucky, maybe win a big pot. So I call the five cents. The turn is a brick. It doesn't really help me at all. And he bets five cents again because this is what he does. So at this point, I put him on probably a draw. He might have a flush draw, something like that. Maybe one pair. I don't think he has a lot. He's just trying to name his price to the river and keep the pot small, which is what he does. So I decide this may be a pretty good bluff spot. If you remember way back to my video I did on bluffing, you know, I talked about good spots to bluff. And most of the time, you're going to bluff in PLO. It's going to be against one opponent. It's going to be heads up and against somebody that, you know, is playing a hand like this, that is playing a hand weakly. They're out of position. They're trying to name their own price. Everything indicates they just don't have a lot here. And so I raise him. I mash the pot button, as we likes to say. Now, I do want to point something out here. When you do this, if you get called, you need to be prepared, depending on the river, to follow up. Okay, sometimes you're going to have to give up. If a club comes, I'm going to have to give up. But on blank rivers, I have to be prepared to follow up. Because I think a lot of the time he's on a draw here or a fairly weak, like one pair hand. So he does call. The river is not a total brick because it does bring in a straight if he has 10 jack. But that's the only thing. If he has 10 jack exactly, he hits. Everything else misses. The clubs miss. And I think a lot, I had seen him chase a lot of flushes. I think a lot of his range was flush draws and maybe a pair. So at this point, I put him on either a missed flush draw or, or maybe a pair. Maybe not even a pair. He checks. Well, now is where I have to be prepared to follow up. I, I, I could check back, but I'm just giving up myself. Notice when I do bluff and when I do take these shots, it's always in small pots. Look at the size. It's only 90 cents. I'm not going to sit there and bluff in a $6 pot because then I got to bet 3 or $4. And, you know, it's not worth risking that much. You can just wait for a big hand. In this case, I only have to bet like 50, 60 cents, maybe as little as 50 cents. I bet 55 looks very valuey. It looks like I'm saying, please call me. I'm betting just over half pot. I got a good hand and I raised you on the turn. Maybe I had a set. Maybe I had 10 jack. He folds. I don't bluff often, 
but when I do, I pick a good spot and a good opponent. And this was a good opponent and a pretty good spot. Okay, let's move on. More 5 PLO. Get a limp, get a limp. As you guys know, I'm obviously going to play this hand. We have a, a connector, rundown, I should say, 5, 6, 7, 8, with a suit. Suit isn't very high, but it's better to have one than not. I would call a raise from any position with this hand. I might even call a 3-bet, because this is a kind of hand, if you happen to hit a board, you can crack a big pair. And crack a hand like Ace, Ace, Jack, 10 or something, if you happen to hit your straight. Even, even a two-pair, if you're against one opponent. So I happily limp behind, and we're going to see a cheap flop, which is fantastic. And I flop the nuts, because as you guys know, every now and then, that's what I like to do. Once again, I think you know I won't be slow playing this hand. It's a wet board. Not only is there a diamond draw that, of course, I don't have, and even if this was diamonds, I don't have a high enough one. Let's say that was a, a six of diamonds. Uh, an eight high flush draw is, is not going to win me a bit. If the money goes in and somebody has a flush draw, I, uh, I'm not going to win that pot. So it wouldn't matter even if I did have diamonds, and I don't. And on top of that, there's, there's higher straight draws. I really can't improve here. Four, five, you know, six, seven, eight. Somebody can be sitting here with like six, nine, ten, and hands like that. Uh, 8, 9, 10, and if a 6 comes, I'm beat. So I need to play this pretty aggressively because I have the nuts right now, but not only is there flush and, and the higher straight draws, somebody can also have two pair of set, as we said before. There's a lot of ways that I can lose this hand, unfortunately. But for now, I got the nuts, and that's a good thing, and I got to play it to the bone, as they say. So this guy bets 5 cents. Uh, this might be the same guy that was in the other hand I'm not sure but obviously this is really weak and, and we're, we're going to be raising so we mash the pot button everybody else folds he calls what does he do this with well there's a lot of possibilities here he easily could have a flush draw he could have a straight draw himself he could have a lower straight he could have 3-6, like we saw the guy on the other end. He could have a lower straight, straight draw, lower straight. Well, he could have a big pair, even. Somebody playing 80-0 could even have something like that. More likely, though, flush draw, straight draw, maybe a set or two pair. Though I don't know if he'd have bet five cents with a set. It's a pretty wet board. Maybe he was afraid to put more money in. It, it's hard to say. That's a good turn for us because it really doesn't help. We did not want to see like an 8, a 9, uh, something like that. We didn't want to see a diamond. That's for damn sure. So this is a good card. Really good card for us. He checks. We mash the pot button. We don't want to slow play this hand. Believe you me. We want to get the money in while we're ahead and keep on getting the money in as much as he's willing to pay us. He calls again. At this point, I'm somewhat discounting sets and two pairs, and I think he's on some kind of draw. I don't know that he really has the odds here. I don't see his hand, but that's my guess. Really nice river for us. I mean, the board couldn't have run out much better than ace-jack, heart, spade. I don't get lucky that often, but this was definitely lucky because nothing got there. Nothing got there. He checks again. Nothing left but to bet. Notice I bet exactly $1.38. Exactly what he has left. And he calls. Now, for some reason, this didn't show us, so I have to go to um, call up the hand. So let's call up the hand and see what he has. And I had it, but I guess it, and here it is. No, I guess not. So hold on. Let's call up the hand. And this will tell us what he has. All righty. 
So as we can see, here's his hand. Here I am, 5, 8, 6, 7, ace, 10, 3, 6. So he indeed had, he actually flopped the lower straight. 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 with the nut flush draw. Yeah, he had a really good hand, actually. Uh, I'll give him credit. He had a nice hand. Uh, he flopped the second nut straight with the nut diamond flush draw. Now, i got to be honest with you. I showed this hand because I'm flying fine with him calling my raise on the flop. I guess, because he does have the diamond flush draw. On the turn against the tightest player at the table with the, the second nut straight here, you know, he has to unfortunately suspect that I can have the nut straight. What else am I betting that aggressively, right? I'm the tightest player at the table. Um, at that point, I think maybe, I don't know that he really has the odds with really just the flush draw. But most important is the river. When the river bricks and all he has is the lower straight, I think he has to fold. Save that last dollar forty, which is uh, twenty-eight big blinds, almost thirty big blinds, twenty-eight big blinds. That's a third of a buy-in almost. I think you need to do that. At that point, what are you beating other than like a missed draw, a bluff, right? Am I gonna barrel three streets, raise the flop, and then bet full pot on the flop? On I'm sorry, in the turn in river with a with worse than than the under straight? No, the second nut straight, whatever you want to call it. I think at that point he has to say he's beat. When that flush doesn't come in, he's got to let it go. So I think he played the hand poorly at the end. I was flying with the flop call. The turn, I'd have to check the odds. He may have had the odds to call. The river was a terrible call. And very poorly done, in my opinion. So I think that was a mistake. Okay. Let's end as a result... He ends up giving me, you know, his full stack. All right, let's go to the next hand. More five PLO. The 10 PLOs will come at the end. Uh, I'm on the button with a connected hand with a suit. Again, good hand to see a flop. Low connected cards and a suited ace. So I limp behind. And we're going to see a cheap flop. So I flop two pair and an open-ended straight draw. Not bad. Problem is I don't have hearts. So that kills some of my outs. The two pair isn't really going to do me much good unless like an ace comes or a three comes. That's four outs at most. Assuming nobody has an ace, right? Nobody has a three. And there's... 20 cards out there so the odds are pretty good so I mean the two pair it's nice to have but it really isn't isn't that meaningful but I do have an open-ended straight draw um, the two combined give me some decent equity you can see but uh, not something I'm willing to stack off with especially given I don't have hearts oh we get a half pot bet a call a call a call a call <laughs> so I'm getting seven to one to call here now I gotta be honest if Say this guy had bet 30 cents and then one of these guys raised, I'm dumping this hand, okay? It's just not that good because, as I said, I don't have hearts and my two pair just isn't even top two, although, you know, it doesn't, uh, ace four versus ace three, not much difference. I've really just got a straight draw. Um, I'm going to have to hit my straight without a heart. So I've got to hit a two or a seven that isn't a heart or an ace, but I still have some outs. That's still three twos and three sevens, and then the ace and the three. So certainly getting seven to one, it's worth a call. But my point is, if there had been some more aggressive betting, I probably would have dumped the hand. But given seven to one, yeah, I'll see another card. Bink. Literally, I don't think there was a better card in the entire deck for me than this card. The best card in the deck. Because if somebody had you know, something like uh, ace five, two five, something like that, they just hit a lower straight than me. Well, if they had two five, they already had a straight. My bad. If they already had two five, they already had a, had a straight, but I just pulled ahead of them. Uh, and I think this is a better card for me even than hitting the ace or the three. And I know that's a full house versus a straight, but it's just 
too likely that somebody else could share that with me or somebody could have an ace and hit a higher full house. In this case, I've now got the nut straight. So that is just a super, super good card and really lucky. So now this guy suddenly bets pot, which is interesting. He bet half pot, called all around. Now he bets full pot. And this guy calls. So what do these guys have? Well, somebody could certainly have a set. Somebody could certainly have the same as me, 5-6, or a lower straight. Somebody could still have maybe a two pair with a flush draw or something. Once again, I got to tell you, I don't care. All I know is I got the nuts right now, and so I'm going to be raising um, and hoping that I don't get sucked out on the river. It really doesn't matter to me what they have because whatever the best they can be is tied with me at this time. So I mash the pot button. This guy doesn't have any money left anyway, but this guy does. And he calls my all-in. This guy calls my all-in. Well, let's see what everybody has. So this guy did have a set, set of fours. And this guy had the two five. So he flopped the straight, but on the turn, I pulled ahead. Now, I showed this hand because I want to point something out. You know how I'm always harping on you guys that you, there's so few spots in PLO where you can slow play a hand. Um, and this was one of them. This guy's uh, player six, I should say, his two five is super vulnerable to higher straight draws, to flush draws, to even, you know, full houses. I guess it may not seem like 15 cents is that much different than 30 cents, but he should have bet more on the flop. Half pot with all these people behind you. You're just encouraging a bunch of people to call. This guy I don't fault as much. I actually think he played it fairly smart. Here's what I mean. You would think, well, when he bet 15 cents and these people called, why didn't he just mash the pot button? He could have done that, and I wouldn't have critiqued it heavily. But the point being, this is a really wet board. And sometimes when you flop a set on a wet board, and not even sometimes, all the time, you've got a pot control. Because unless you hit your full house, you're no good. And this was a great example. He was already behind this guy that flopped, player six that flopped the straight. And on the turn, he's losing to me. He's now behind both of us. Now he's down to 14% equity because a lot of his outs are held by other players. And so he's only got like six outs to hit his full house versus the normal 10 hit his full house or quads. Uh, but the point being, when you have a set on and, and not even top set on a really wet board, there are times when you just can't proceed aggressively. And this was probably one of them, and I give this guy credit. Uh, I think that he actually played this hand the same way I would have. On the turn, I'm not, I'm not sure if I would have called the buck 20. I guess he didn't have a lot of money. At that point, I might have figured with that many players, it was just it was just too likely somebody had a straight, and I might have dumped it. But he didn't have a lot of money left. But I totally understand his not raising on the flop. Now, uh, I've got this guy fairly well crushed. He's going to have to hit, uh, I guess, a six to beat me. So he's only got the six. And this guy's going to have to hit a full house. They don't. And I win a really big pot. I take both their stack. Well, I take a full $5 or more off of him. And I take his whole stack. And I win... Uh, 11.50 after rake went over $12. So that worked out really well. But he should have played it more aggressively. May not have mattered, but he should have played it more aggressively. Don't don't slow play on on dangerous boards. This guy I thought played it pretty well except he could have at least thought about folding on the turn. I remember he called instantly. I don't know if that really would have uh, actually, he has a straight two, doesn't he? Ace the two gave him a straight. Ace two, three, four, five. So actually, on the turn, he had a straight two. I guess not just the set. So I guess his call was okay on the turn. I didn't even see that. He had a straight also. My bad. All right, interesting hand though. Let's move on to our next one.
So I'm sitting here with a double suited uh, hand, 5, 6, 10, 10, and a pair. I could flop a set, could flop a straight draw. Uh, I'd been at this table for a while, had been a lot of limping, so I decide to try to limp. I don't open limp very often, guys, but I decide to go ahead and try to limp here, seeing if I can see a, a flop cheaply, just in case I do hit something good. And indeed, well, it looked like that worked out. Now this guy raises. But I'm okay with calling here because, again, I could flop a set. I could flop a straight or flush draw. I mean, obviously, 10 high is not really great, but uh, it's not horrible. So I call. As always, we'll see a flop, and uh, we don't hit something. We just move on. So we go three-way to the flop. I don't really hit anything here. I do have second pair, pocket tens, but that's about it. And another reason I call is that it's it's quite likely that somebody, you know, does this with a big pair. And this is, again, not a bad hand to bust a big pair. So he checks, I check, this player checks. Turn is a king. Brings a diamond flush draw out there. Other than that, doesn't seem to really change much. Checks. I've now got two over cards. Had this been like a three... I might have bet here because now my 10 second pair is looking better. Nobody's bet. And I might have put out like 40, 45 cents. But with a second over card, I decide it's really against two opponents. It's really not worth it. And so I just check. This guy checks. So there's been no betting at this point. No betting on the flop. No betting on the turn. We go to the river. Well, I hit a two outer on the river. And I bink the full house. The under full. 10s over 8s. Believe it or not, this is only the fourth nuts. Because obviously quad 8s beat me. A pair of jacks would beat me. A pair of kings would beat me. So I have the fourth nuts even though I have a full house. Seems crazy, but that's how PLO works. What I liked about this card, though, and I remember at the time, was that it was a diamond and a 10. Because now both the flush and the straight come in. And either one of these guys could have been sitting on a flush draw or a straight draw. And now they might think they're good. There's been no betting up to this point, having no idea that I'm sitting here with a pair of 10s and I just hit a full house. So I feel like my full house is pretty well disguised. And there are hands out there, good hands, straights, flushes, maybe even a nut flush that can't beat me. So this guy suddenly bets full pot. He checked the flop, checked the turn. And so at the time, my thought was, there's a pretty good chance he just hit a straight or a flush. And he's trying to get value because he didn't bet any of the other streets, and I've got him beat. The problem is we have the under full. We can't beat a pair of jacks. We can't beat a pair of kings. We obviously can't beat quad eights, as unlikely as they might seem. This is PLO. So the question is, do you just call here, or do you raise that is always a tough question in these spots. Always a tough question. Uh, I decide to raise because I feel like there's a lot more combos of straights and flushes than there are of him having like King King or Jack Jack. And I want to get value for my lucky river. So I raise. This guy folds. Well, now he does this. And at this point, I'm pretty much vomiting in my mouth. But for the price I'm getting, I only have to be good 14% of the time. And so I have to call. When he did this, I thought, oh, crap, he's probably got jacks or kings, um, maybe eights. But if there's even a 14% chance that he has a flush or a straight, I got to call. So I do. And, uh, of course, he does have kings. He actually has a straight, uh, too, right? The river gave him, you know, right? Eight, nine, ten, jack, queen. Yeah, he has a straight, too. Didn't need it because he hit the full house. But see, this is what I was thinking. Now, think about, actually, it's a straight flush, isn't it? Maybe I stand corrected here. Does he have a straight flush? Eight, nine, ten. No, he has uh, almost a straight flush. Not quite. Okay. <laughs> he does have the full house, though. But anyways, my point was, I had put him on, imagine if this card was like uh, 
you know, an ace or a jack, then he would have rivered the flush and could very well feel he was good here. And he wasn't because my full house is quite disguised. Sadly, so was his. So it's always a tough choice, guys, with the under full. Do you call? Do you raise? There is no set rule. It really depends on the situation. In this case, I decided to raise. Unfortunately, I got burned. But I do think that a lot of the time he can have hands other than king, king, or jack, jack, or quads. And uh, so it just depends on the situation. This was one where you know, it didn't work out. But always be thinking to yourself when you have the under full, you know, play back in your head how the hand went. Remember, the flop was checked, the turn was checked, nobody had bet, and so it just didn't seem that likely. I thought maybe he had ace-ace, or he hit his flush on the river, which he did, but he had better and he was trying to get some late value. Uh, if there had been a lot more action, I don't think, I, I think I would have just called, I wouldn't have raised. So it's very situation dependent. Okay, let's go to our next hand. I raise, I have kings with a suit and a suited ace. This is a dangler, but uh, in latish position, it's a, it's a pretty good hand. Get a call, get a call, get a call. Because this is Omaha, people don't fold. And I flop the classic situation, top set on a wet board against multiple opponents. And this is this is a wet board because people tend to call raises, especially from the tightest player at the table, with hands that have uh, Broadway cards in them. So it's very, very possible, if not probable, that one or more of our opponents have straight draws and flush draws here. Somebody can easily have a straight draw. They can have an ace, a jack, a king, a ten, a queen in their hand. They can easily, excuse me, have spades. We have the best hand now. We can't have any less than the best hand right now, but we are vulnerable. 62% equity with top set. Look at that, top set, 62%. So I think you guys know I'm, I'm going to be playing this hand pretty fast because I cannot... Uh, give away any kind of free card or cheap cards. Forget about free cards. I can't even give away cheap cards. If someone bets pot, I have to raise them or dump the hand. Now, I want to point out, if this was, for example, a 10 or a jack, then then I have to, then I have to think twice. Against three opponents, the most I would do then is call because I could already be beat. Notice the difference. On this board, nobody can be ahead of me right now. They might outdraw me but they can't be ahead right now and that's the key if this was some kind of face card or if this was a spade i could be already beaten and that's when you don't want to be playing it too aggressively and so that other hand when that guy had a set of fours but the flop came you know ace three four he could have already been beat and that's the spots where you got to be careful this isn't quite the same so we get a check we do get a full pot bet. So I think you know, I, I pretty much got to be raising here. This is one of those situations where even though you know your hand is vulnerable, you've got to go balls to the wall. You just got to mash the pot button and hope that your hand holds. Um, if you don't want to do that, then it's better to actually fold. I'd rather see you fold than just flat call to the river. I think that's a mistake. That's just my opinion. But I believe the best way is to play this aggressively because you, you do have the guaranteed nuts right now. Um, if you want to just flat call, I think you're really taking a chance. So I mash the pop button because that's what you've just got to do here, knowing that I'm going to be facing some hands with a pretty decent amount of equity, potentially. And now this guy raises all in. So I know he's got, at the very least, some kind of, some kind of draw. And this guy calls. Now, unfortunately, I cannot re-raise. There's not enough difference between the fourth or two. All I can do is call here. If I could, I would put the rest of my money in right now. But I can't. So I call. Turn is not exactly a good card. Brings a second flush draw. It completes a straight. But let's look at the numbers. Okay, let's look at the stack to pot ratio, the SPR. There's $21 in there, and I've got four bucks left. 
And this guy's got 328. He's already all in. So I think you guys know I'm, I'm not folding here. I'm committed to the hand. I'm going with the hand. I still could easily be good. I've got outs to hit a full house. I'm not folding. But I wasn't happy to see this card. That's for damn sure. And this is why you cannot slow play these hands. He checks. I put the rest of my money in. He calls. Let's take a look. So indeed, this guy had the gut shot straight draw and the nut flush draw. The queens are no good because obviously hitting a queen doesn't help him. That gives me a full house and I had a higher set anyway. This guy, so I'm relatively okay with how this guy played it. I mean, against a set, um, he has decent equity, although it's probably a flip. Let's take a look and see. Let's actually take a look and see. Actually, I think there's an easier way. Let's do this. Launch equity calculator. Okay. What I want to do is eliminate this guy from the whole thing. We already know what the equity is for all three. It's up there. What I want to do is get rid of this guy and see between the two of us how he was. So on the flop, and let's get rid of the ace of diamonds. Okay. So on the flop, guys, where I have top set, and he's got the flush draw and a gut shot. How are we doing? Well, I'm a I'm a two to one favorite. So he has thirty seven percent equity. So he's getting his money in as a two to one dog. But remember, if somebody bets full pot, you know, you get it's two to one odds. So I guess he had just barely the equity. But still, he's he's a 2 to 1. You can see now he's down to 25% equity. But he only had less than 38% equity on the flop between the two of us. So I was still way ahead. So a set is still well ahead. But do I blame him for getting his money in? I guess not. Because remember, a set is, is pretty much the top of my range. Right? Although I'm not the kind of guy that's going to get it in with a worse flush draw. I mean, Ace King, I'm not going to get it in here with a jack high flush draw, I don't think. He's got the jack. So I'd have to be getting it in with a 10 high flush draw. I'm never doing that. I'm not getting it in with just a straight draw, probably. Have to have a big wrap. So me personally, all I can have here is a set. But he doesn't necessarily know that. Um, but you can see, I'm a 2 to 1 favorite against, against his range. So that's why I'm willing to get the money in for sure. And here on the turn, I've got 44%. This guy actually, because he picked up a flush draw and has the two pair and now a straight draw too, has 31. This guy's only got 25. He got the least amount of equity. But I still have to dodge a 10. I have to dodge a jack. And I have to dodge a spade. That's still quite a few cards to dodge. And unfortunately, the spade comes. I win the side pot over this guy, but I lose the main pot. And that's just what it is. There's nothing I can do. Got my money in good. That's all I can do. So I win the side pot. And he wins the main pot. And this guy gets busted. And I think he played it poorly. Having on the flop, all he had was top pair, right? Kings. No, two pair. Kings and queens. And that was it. That's, that's terrible. Against us two, two people stacking off. I think that was horrible. I do. And he deserved to lose his stack in my opinion. But when you're in these spots and you've got top set, you've either got to play it balls to the wall or let it go. You may hang on, you may not, but that's how you've got to play it. And you can see why, because you can face just big draws. You can't let them draw cheaply. Um, takes a strong stomach, let me tell you. No question. No question. Okay. Let's move on. 5 PLO. So this guy raises on the button. I decide to defend. I have a pair of queens with a suit and connected cards against a single range. I raise. I don't have a lot of information on this guy, but uh, I think this is fine for another 12 cents. So I call. 
Now, I flopped top set again, but I want to point out again the difference to you guys. This isn't, you know, Queen Jack 3. Then I'm willing to get the money. And this is Queen Jack 9. I can already be beat if somebody has either 8 10 or 10 king. Not to mention all the myriad of draws that have a lot of equity against me. Now, I only have one opponent. That's the good news. Seems only four hands, seems taggy so far. But this is a board that I'm not nearly as likely to get aggressive on because I can already be beat. I would much rather pot control here and try to play a smaller pot because if the money goes in, and this is a spot where if I start getting aggressive and I start blasting re-raises or pot size bets, one of two things happens, guys. I win a small pot or I can lose a big one because somebody can have a nutted hand that is better than top set. So I'm going to win a small pot or lose a big one and that's not that's some pretty big reverse implied odds that's not a good formula for making money so I check he checks I'm just trying to pot control here well a turn makes it worse the turn had been a brick I might have let out but this is terrible card now there's just made straights all over the place even though it's just one opponent if a lot of money goes in I am not in good shape I check so he bets 18 cents. Well, I'm certainly willing to call that. I've got a 20% shot of boating up on the river. I need a 9, a 10, a jack, or a queen for quads. That's 10 outs, not 22%. I need 25. So I'm really close. Happy to call. No problem. The river's a brick. So the question is, does he have a straight? The flush missed, does he have a straight or not? I check again. He bets half pot. I only need to be good one in four times for this to be a profitable call. And I think top set is good one in four times. So I call. Didn't want to play a big pot, but I was fine with playing this. And he had a pair of kings. So I win. This is the way, even against one opponent, you often need to play top set when the board is already this wet. When you have the best possible hand at the time, like I did the previous hand with the set of kings, then you want to play balls to the wall, in my opinion. But when you don't have the best hand, necessarily, when there are already hands that beat you, and then it gets worse on the turn, that's when you have to pot control. And as you can see, I won a small pot. And I'll take that every day of the week and twice on Sundays, over losing my whole stack, which is what can happen if you play too aggressively and somebody does happen to have, you know, the hand that would be the nuts here straight. Okay. So, two different hands, top set both times, but two very different boards and two different ways of playing it. Good to know. Let's look at our next hand. More 5 PLO. We get a limp. Uh, this is a nice hand to limp behind on the button. A pocket pair plus a suited ace. Could flop a set, could hit a flush, not flush draw. So I do. And we're going to see a nice cheap flop. And I don't really hit anything. Get a check, 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 and I check. Because I ain't got nothing. Well, pair of nines turn brings in a flush. Even worse. Now I really have nothing. Check. Check. Okay. So the river, does this look familiar, guys? So the river gives me a boat. And the problem is, once again, I have the under full. This one's a bit different, though. Because these cards are smaller. So Well, it's different, but I guess it isn't because the problem being, yes, and somebody with a pair of twos or a pair of fives can't beat me and a flush can't beat me, but any combo of a jack with these. So if somebody has jack two or jack five or jack nine, it might seem unlikely. There's only one nine left in the deck, but this is Omaha. I lose to all of those. 
So I've got like uh, the fifth nuts, believe it or not, because they could have quads. And then they can have jack two or jack five. Those both beat me. There's three hands that beat me or jack nine. So that's four hands that beat me. I had the fifth nuts with a full house. So we get a 10 cent bet, two folds. So I'm faced with the same question. Do I just call? Do I raise? Now there are four hands that beat me, as I said, but I still believe that there's a lot of other things this guy can have. He can have just a jack, naked trips. He could have hit a flush. He could have two pair. Um, I hate to call for 10 cents and win such a tiny pot if indeed I, I, my full house is good. So I go ahead and raise. Then this happens. Well, now I know. Oh, geez. But I want you to notice something here. I don't re-raise. At this point, I'm like, okay. Now he very possibly has one of those four hands. Again, I need to be good 33% of the time. I decide it's worth it. I just call. I'm not going to stick my whole stack in here. Because the odds are he has one of those four hands that beat me. And the son of a bitch has quads. So he flopped quads, didn't bet the flop, didn't bet the turn, finally bet the river. And I think that was a mistake on his part because this is a pretty wet board. You had the flush draw, then you had the made flush. He should have been betting. When I don't see any betting until the river, that's when I'm more inclined to raise with the underfold like this. Unfortunately, in my case, this was a guy that isn't particularly good and he slow played his quads he could have ended up making nothing with his quads if i don't hit that if that river is an eight instead of a nine this guy makes 20 cents with his quads he got lucky because the river gave me a boat but what if it didn't so i think he played this poorly in my opinion but again when you have the under full guys just be careful look at the situation look at the opponent there are times when, like here, you, you're going to want to try to raise for value, but when you get re-raised, you got to know that it's not looking too good for you. Although I've seen people re-raise and just show up with like the nut flush or something, but most of the time it's a higher full house or quads. Uh, but notice I limited my losses. I wasn't going to put the whole stack in. Okay. Two more hands. Here's some 10 PLO. Limp, limp, limp. Really nice hand to limp behind on the button. All Broadway, pair of jacks, and a suited queen. Great hand to see a flop with. So we go six way. And I flop top set. Now, I want to point out that this may not look like a really wet board, but I'm still going to be playing this hand pretty fast. There may not be a flush draw, but if a nine comes, even an eight, which somebody could have nine queen, right? An eight, a nine, uh, a queen, a king, um, an ace, any of those could give somebody a straight. So I cannot slow play this hand. So we get this ridiculous 10 cent bet into a 60 cent pot. A call, a call. So I've seen people in this spot just call because they say, well, this board's not really that wet. You know what? Do so at your own risk. Do so at your own peril. I believe that's a mistake. First off, for the obvious reason, because it's just so easy to get outdrawn. But again, second off, this is where people will call. People will chase those draws. If we get brick, brick, you know, people aren't, aren't going to call. This is where you can raise and you'll get a caller or two because they still have equity and can still hit. You may not get paid off if you slow play to the river and just, you know, what if you call and then the turn is like a, a deuce, 10 cents, 10 cents, 10 cents. You're just going to let 10 cents go in and not get any value for top set? I think that's a mistake. So I mash the pot button. So this player calls. 
What does he put 10 cents in with and then call? I don't know, maybe two pair? Maybe an open-ended straight draw could have queen king, could have nine queen? Who knows? The other people fold. Turn is a pretty good card. First off, because it's a club, can't have a flush. Second off, it's not a Broadway. So once again, I have to have the best hand right now. I can be outdrawn, but I have to have the best hand at this point. Well, here comes the ridiculous 10 cent bet. I do not understand the point of this, but I think you know what's going to be coming. We mash the pot button again. He calls. What does a person bet one big blind, two straight streets, and yet call a pot size raise? At this point, I was shaking my head. I'm thinking, well, maybe like a set of fives or something like that. Again, a straight draw like Queen King, an open-ended straight draw, which, by the way, he doesn't have the odds. He should not be calling here, but I'm thrilled if he is. Really nice river because I actually had 10-jack, ace-queen. I had a gut shot, and I just hit my gut shot. If a Broadway had to come, that is the best possible Broadway, obviously, because I just hit the nut straight. 10-jack, queen, king, ace. How sweet it is. Only thing better would be the board pairing to give me a full house. And that would have been a bit more obvious. This might be more disguised. So now he suddenly bets full pot. 10 cents, 10 cents, now he bets full pot. Well, my thought was one of two things happened here. Either he also has ace queen, and I'm splitting with him, in which case, what can you do? Or he had something like a two pair or a set of fives over that missed and he thought well maybe he's got a set and this is going to scare him and this would have been a scary card if i didn't have ace queen no doubt if this was jack jack three seven or whatever i would not be happy with this card and he may have been counting on that but i've got the nuts so we mash the pot button get all the money in he calls the pot now stands at 34 dollars what does this guy have? And it doesn't show us. Okay, let's call it up. So what did he do that with? Well, let's take a look and see. Must add a monster hand, right? Let's find out. Here he is right here, the guy that lost $16.78 of his $21 pot. He had jacks and tens. That was it. Two pair. Top two. So on the flop, he flopped top two pair. That 10 cents I raised, he called. The turn gave him a gutter, I guess, four, five, seven, eight, and top two. He calls my raise again. The river is a complete brick for him. Brings in a straight. He still just got tens and jacks. I could beat him with a better two pair now. He decides to stuff all the money in. He bluffs the river against the tightest player at the table. And guess what, pal? You just lost 168 big blinds with two pair. Because that's what donkeys do. I think he horribly misplayed that hand. Horribly misplayed that hand. Two pair is never, ever, 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 ever good when the money goes in against me. And he paid for that one. But again, guys, this is why you want to play these hands fast. Because you might get somebody to spew off their chips like this. And your best chance of getting them to pay you is while they still have an active draw. Once the river comes, you're calling 10 cent bets, you may not get any more money. And this guy gave me a monster, monster. So I win a, a monster pot. And that worked out really well. Okie doke. I think we have one last hand. We do. Let's take a look at it. So, some more 10 PLO for our last hand. So everybody folds. It comes to me on the button. Um, 
I have a triple Broadway with a suit. It is triple suited, but on the button, I think this is a perfectly good hand to raise. And so I do. 24 cents though. Notice I raise 2.4x, pretty small. So this guy three bets me. Don't have any information on him, right? Only played three hands, hasn't played a hand yet. No idea. If there's any information, he might be a little bit tight because he hasn't played a hand yet. So if you remember my video on three betting and four betting in Omaha, one thing that I said in there and is really important to remember, if nothing else, is that in the absence of any other information, we generally will assume that when somebody who seems like a reasonable player, not some wacko maniac crazy whale, when they three bet us, their range is heavily weighted toward what? Big pairs. Aces, kings, sometimes with a suit, sometimes with two suits, sometimes without. Most common hand, aces with a suit. Okay, so his range is pretty heavily weighted toward that. This is a decent hand to try to crack it aces with. Because I have flush and straight draw possibilities here. So I happily call the uh, extra 58 cents. We go to the flop. And I flop top two pair, jacks and sevens. Now, normally, this is not a situation that I would stack off in, or even close. Let's just say play a big pot with. You guys know that I've gone on and on about not playing big pots with two pair in Omaha. This, however, is a bit of an exception, and I'm going to tell you why. This is a three-bet pot heads up against one opponent. And so if he indeed has, say, aces or kings, suit or not, doesn't matter. There's no, no flush draw out there. He can't beat our, our top two pair. I'm way ahead of aces or, uh, or kings. Yes, we can be outdrawn. He can hit another pair, but we've got a lot of equity. And let's just take a quick look. So uh, this says random. Let's give him a hand, okay? Let's say that he had uh, ace of spades, uh, ace of hearts, um, Oops, my bad. Uh, ten of spades, uh, four of diamonds. Okay, so he's got aces with a suit. Let's bring this up. So let's see how we're doing. Oop. Board card and player hand. Okay, my bad. So what did I give him? Ace of spades, ace of hearts. Ten of spades, four of diamonds. Oh, the four of diamonds is out there. My bad. That's easy. To, let's make it a five. That should be good. Okay, so look at that. I'm a 75 to 25 favorite. So I've got his aces crushed. Assuming he's got aces or kings, doesn't matter, you know, queens. I mean, I'm a three to one favorite. This is one of those spots where if he's stupid enough to stack off, we're going to go. Yes, we could be outdrawn. Yes, he could have, you know, flopped a set. He could have something else. I don't know, jacks or something. Obviously, though, we have a blocker. But you get my point. When we know his range is heavily weighted towards something like this, and we're heads up in a three-bet pot, and we flop top two, we're not going away. We're not going away. Not when we're probably a, a three-to-one favorite. So he does exactly what I hoped he would do. He bets full pot. Because this flop looks pretty good for aces, doesn't it? That's a pretty dry board. I'd take that flop. Unfortunately for him, I mash the pop button. Ba-boom. Now, if I were him at this point, I would be very concerned. And if I just had a big pair, I'd dump the hand. First off, I wouldn't have bet full pot. I'd have bet something like a dollar or so, dollar ten, whatever. And then if I get raised, I'm going to dump it. Is our friend smart enough to do that? Nope. 
money goes in. I'm happy to call. Oops, just a pair of queen. He three bet me with this. Nine, ten, queen, queen, suited to the ten. Out of position. Horrible play. Complete donkey move. Well, now I've got a pretty big edge on him. Yes, he could still get lucky. Could hit a queen. Could hit some kind of a, well, I guess an eight would give him a straight. So he needs to hit an eight or a queen. Or uh, the board needs to pair to give him a bigger two pair. But, you know, I'm a solid, almost two to one favorite. Turns a brick. Now I'm a three to one favorite. The river, river cooperates and I win a full 100 big blinds. So this is why we call three bets in Omaha, even with hands like this. Because if somebody is stupid enough to put their whole stack in with just an over pair, we can take it because this isn't Hold'em. In Hold'em, I could see getting your money in with queens on this board. Not in PLO, my friends. And thankfully, this player was stupid enough and handed his whole stack to us. And this is the one instance where two pair is the kind of hand you will stack off with. Heads up in a three bet pot. Against all except for the, you know, very, very tightest of opponents. Okay, guys, that's all that I have for you today. I hope that you've enjoyed this uh, video, part two of my hand history review. Uh, any questions or comments, post them on the forums. And until next time, this has been CF The Natural for grinderschool.com and good luck at the tables.